look like panel. Um, I'll start by having each one of you guys introduce yourself. You can talk about your company, what you do there real quick. Um, we'll go through a series of questions, open it up. If anyone's got a question, feel free. We can make this as interactive as possible, but why don't we start with you, Dan? Uh, my name is Dan Stieglitz. I'm the founder and CEO of Stainless Code. Stainless Code builds content automation tools for sports media. We, uh, we work with MLB and the NFL, uh, a lot of startups. We do um, data and video content tools. We have, um, we have an artificial intelligence that we develop that can watch and understand sports media that we're really excited about. And um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Hi, everyone. Whoa. Hi, everyone. I'll move the microphone back. My name is Ido Nivran. I'm the VP of Sales at Webbits. Um, at Webbits, we believe that telling a powerful story should be easy. So we created a platform that leverages automation, artificial intelligence to help create quick videos. Uh, we work with a lot of broadcasters in the space as well, uh, since we're here. But we work with pretty much anyone from many different sectors, um, basically sports teams, colleges, nonprofit organizations, broadcasters such as NBC, CBS, and so forth. And um, basically, we help them supplement their long-form, highly produced videos with short-form content as well. Um, yeah, hi, my name is uh, Jeroen um, from X Machina. Uh, we traditionally make uh, second screen apps uh, for TV shows, allowing you to interact, uh, talent shows like The Voice, game shows that you play along with, sports, where you make predictions, news, where you give your opinion. Um, now also focusing more and more on uh, integrating that with live streaming platforms, Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitch, that allow you to interact from the same interface, so it's no longer second screen, but all integrated. Uh, and also uh, we provide our clients with a solution for ultra low latency video streaming and integrated inter interactivity in the same app. So it's kind of uh, all unified into a single experience that you can tr control and also monetize. Great, I'm excited. We have a wide ranging panel from different things, all dealing with user experience. So. Um, I got asked this question on the panel I was in this morning, kind of relates to here, kind of related to the first question. So they asked me, seven years in the future, what do you think the home experience, television experience will be like for viewers? You guys can tell me if I'm wrong or right. I basically said the video experience at home hasn't really changed since 1940 much. There's been innovations on top of it, but the experience is relatively the same. So um, starting, you look like you have a, a very, guttural reaction to that. So we'll start with you, Ido. What do you, what do you guys see as the future of experiences in general? And then we can get into some more in-depth stuff as we go. I, I think that um, based on what you said, I, I agree with you. It hasn't changed in the sense, in a certain sense, but in many ways, like the way we view screens in general have changed a lot. So, you know, in the past, we used to, I remember myself even as a kid, like sitting around the TV and watching something uh, live all together at a certain time of the week, right? Uh, and that's completely changed. I think um, our expectations of content have changed as well. Uh, we want it faster, we want it better, we want it uh, whenever we want to watch it. So uh, that's changed a lot. And I think that screens will be integrated into every facet of our everyday lives much more. So uh, whether it's interacting with, uh, uh, instead of phone calls, interacting with uh, you know things like the new Amazon devices with the screens in them, um, and incorporating those into the actual household. So connected devices, connected to everything, right? So um, our, the way we will view content will not be as it is now, where we view it as like something that we're dedicating time to. It'll be, just be integrated in our daily life, right? Like I remember, I don't remember what movie it was, but there's some sort of uh, movie where I remember it was like there's a screen incorporated in the mirror and, you know, the, it's like a futuristic movie and you're, you know, you're, putting on your whatever, your moisturizer, lotion, whatever, and in the meantime, you're watching your content uh, being streamed to you. So we'll be much more connected in that sense. And I think because of that, the fluidity of content is going to change and our expectations and how we create it will have to shift as well. Well, I, I think it's also um, not just look at uh, uh, new things that are evolving, but also old things that are coming back. And what I'm very excited about is that after we've seen uh, in the video on the mount age where people just watch stuff on their own um, and maybe that has led to binge watching and other things that have been good for the industry, uh, but also we lost something. We, we lost a sense of urgency, a sense of belonging and that television has always had, the appointment television uh, idea, um, the water cooler effect. Social media has brought some of it back, second screen has brought some of it back. 
but I think if you look at phenomenons like uh, HQ Trivia, that now two, two million people uh, decide to all start nap at exactly the same moment um, in order to play a little game show. Um, and I think that's, that's uh, just the tip of the iceberg. I think we'll see a lot more of those kind of social, um, nationwide, even global things that are going to happen that, are, that will attract millions of people at the same time and are going to be fully interactive as well. So um, <clears throat> I'll address the sports part of this, but I think the sports experience is going to be radically different. I think that you're going to see um, not only a lot more interactivity, but a lot more customization on almost all levels. So customization of advertising, customization of clips and media that you're going to watch, uh, customization of data. So you'll be able to create a sports experience that's unique to your likes um, and maybe even create an experience that's unique to the dislikes of uh, your rivals that are watching. So all kinds of interesting things uh, are possible in sports in the future and I think that the, the marriage of data and video will really power some amazing sports experiences in the future. Following up on that, what what needs to be done to fill the gap between data and sports today to power an experience like that, besides using your platform? <laughs> well, that's a good start. Uh, no, so if you really want to fill the gap, uh, what's interesting is that we are on the cusp of really seeing those experiences come to fruition. All the pieces that we really needed to make those experiences happen are now here. We just need to put them together. So, for example. We have rich data feeds that we have from vendors and from the courts. Um, we have, in some cases, people acquiring data themselves. There are companies like ScoreStream that let you uh, crowdsource some of that information. Uh, and now we have, and, and this is the real, the real sort of change, is that we have OTT. So we have fully digital enabled streams uh, without sort of the, um, <clears throat> for lack of a better word, chains that come along with a traditional broadcasting. And that really will allow us to uh, build these next generation experiences. And I'm not, not even to mention VR and AR, which are incredible technologies which will really bring those experiences home. What type of experiences do you think from a second screen perspective could be created around sports, around these events that are kind of happening where you say everyone's going to kind of come together? Well, the area in that space that I'm most excited for is esports. Um, and I think the main reason that I'm excited about it is that uh, unlike traditional sports where referees and coaches um, have basically a monopoly on what, what, what's happening and the players themselves, of course, um, and the audience is at best can cheer at, at their athletes, at, 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 at the teams, um, with the esports, there are no referees. There are no coaches typically either. Um, it's all algorithmic. It's all data. Um, so in that way, you can have uh, uh, the, the, the viewer can have a much more personalized experience. So whatever his interests are, you can get the data that's most relevant for him or her. Uh, but also, you can have many more ideas of making sports interactive, of letting the viewers be part. Perhaps they can play a mini game that's just associated. Uh, with the main thing, if it's a fighting game, they can they can decide who gets a, which team gets a weapon drop, uh, things that are inconceivable in traditional sports because they're so holy, they're so kind of you will never change the rules of football. Um, but in esports, it's it's just happening. I was at the Overwatch League last Thursday, and it's just amazing. A two-year-old game now easily getting 100,000 plus viewers uh, over the internet. So it's just the surface that we're scratching. Wouldn't it be much better to crowdsource instant reviews and in player uh, than go back to New York? Or, that would be amazing. Yeah, right. Uh, teams would have to get people to watch, right, to get better uh, better judgments. And then well, no one could get angry at the refs, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> The stuff you guys do at Wibbits, I think, is a different type of experience, right? Because you're creating a content experience as opposed to an end user like user like experience. You want to explain kind of something? Yeah, so we, we create the content creation experience uh, in a little bit of a different way. We open it up to more people. In the past, uh, you know, traditionally, creating video is very difficult uh, for anyone, right? Publishers, broadcasters, uh, any storyteller of any kind. Um, you'd have to rely on people who really knew what they were doing, professionals in video editing, and uh, typically it would take a long time to create videos uh, like that in-house. Um, and so, you know, the, the problem that, that most uh, content creators face is two things. One, it becomes very expensive. And two, when it comes to breaking news and reporting quickly with video, it's very difficult to do. 
Um, so we are trying to kind of flatten the playing field and really allow content creators to use our platform to create videos very quickly. Um, and that's really what we're all about, just speed, ease of use. Uh, but the final product looks like a f highly produced quality video. Um, so you still get that final look that you're looking for, and we can customize the look based on, you know, tailored to the specific style guides of any content creator. So I've heard the personalized experience a couple times already. So obviously with Mark Zuckerberg today in front of Congress, what do you think the appetite is for the common end user uh, to, be, to give up that data to be able to get the personalized experience back? What's the appetite in the space? Does that exist today or do people not realize what they, they're missing out on and is this something we'll see 2019 and beyond? What do you think, Euro? Well, I think an area where there's lots of opportunity is um, getting shorter ad breaks in return for being more targeted. It's been talked about for a long time, but I think we finally start to see some technologies and solutions hit the market that do it. It's not what our company does, but I, I, as a consumer, I would totally be willing to share some of my personal data if that would reduce the advertising load I, I see in my favorite shows. I'm actually a blockchain enthusiast, so I have kind of like an extreme... Uh, outlook on advertising online in general so um, this is kind of kind of unique but you know run with me here so I think that uh, we will see a transition in the future towards browsers that will uh, incentivize people to give their data um, and be targeted uh, ads that make sense for them and advertising that just resonates with their interests right and aligns with those and in return um, basically uh, they will get free browsing, right? So they'll get uh, free access to paid subscription kind of sites. So um, instead of you feeling like you're being kind of coerced to watch an advertisement or, um, you know, forced to kind of close out one of those annoying banners that pop up on your screen, um, you'll be able to kind of go to the sites that you're interested in. And in return, you'll have to watch an X amount of time of ads. Um, and it'll be kind of like a fair trade-off, but it'll be very transparent. I think uh, that'll block off some of the issues that we're facing with data in general. So you won't really have to collect it illegally. <laughs> uh, I think the fallout from this Facebook fiasco is going to be pretty widespread, and there's going to be a fundamental shift in the regulatory thinking on personal data. I'm not quite sure where that's going to end up, but um, more so in other countries where data is even a more sensitive issue, like in Europe. Uh, in the US, we're a little bit loosey-goosey with it, but I think we're going to see a shift here, there as well. So I think those are great ideas that the other panelists were saying in terms of um, maybe incentivizing you f uh, by giving up your data to get some features, but there's this sort of unknown regulatory aspect I think we're gonna have to contend with also. Um, I think that'll be good overall when we get a little bit more regulation on it uh, because I think it's clear that we probably can't trust Silicon Valley with our data as is, but I think it will also open up a lot of opportunities. And I think um, features uh, like those that were discussed will can become a reality in that kind of environment. Yeah, and just just to say something, I mean, advertising is is necessary, right? I mean, some something has to pay the bills, something has to keep the light the lights on, keep people creating content. So, um, as long as that is the case, I'd say why not make that advertising experience as as good as possible, right? Like, I, I mean, I sometimes I do scroll through Instagram and I find that the targeting for me is very good. Um, so it doesn't bother, bother me as much. I actually have like a, a bookmark for shopping, you know, that I just kind of bookmark certain advertisements that are served to me. So, you know, I, I do think that there's a lot of place to improve our targeting towards people uh, and specifically align with their interests. And when that happens, it's not as much of an intrusive experience. I say it to my, I think YouTube does a great job of it from the creator's perspective, right? I say it to my millennial cousin all the time is that she doesn't want to pay for anything. I'm like, every YouTube video you're being marketed to and you don't even realize it with the brands that are embedded in it. So they do a good job. But as far as incentives, I actually think, I saw recently like on um, the Fox Now app, I thought something they really did really unique is they put up front a selection of, um, do you want to watch a single ad now and get the rest of the experience free or do you want to watch? And it gives the user the ability and then they're giving the advertiser a highly targeted ad because the person's actually selecting 
what what they want to watch. Now right? think that about that on like a, a browser level, right. right? Where it's not a specific, you know, Fox Now. It's it's you're going to your browser into whatever Chrome, and then you just get credits for watching advertising that you choose. You choose the advertisements you watch. You get credits for those. Uh, for those minutes that you're spending watching those advertisements, and then in return you're getting X amount of time of advertising-free browsing, yeah. right? Like that would be amazing. Uh, I, yeah, I think Fox is pioneering this space, and um, what I what makes me happy is that they're now we're now on the cusp of having a currency for engagement. Uh, it's not just eyeballs in a certain demographic that that have an equal price no matter who the eyeballs are, but now. Uh, People who are who are engaged or willing to engage are worth more to advertisers, meaning the advertisers can pay more, meaning that you can make better content or have less ads, uh, and that's exactly what I mean. So, so yep. yeah, I think that's the example is perfect of, of where hopefully we'll, we'll see a lot more of it and perhaps even an open standard for it. Yeah, I, I just using the word currency is, is exactly what I meant before when I said I'm a blockchain enthusiast. There is a browser called Brave uh, that's launched. Uh, the creator of Mozilla created it. And basically, it, there is a token called BAT, or Behavioral Attention Token, which is exactly that. And you get paid bats or How BATs. much of that have you purchased? I've not, I've, <laughs> I've not used the browser. I've downloaded it just to see kind of like the experience. But, but it is, I mean, that's the direction. It's exactly it. Um, back to HQ, which you mentioned. Do you think, it's, it's one thing to do on an app when people have your mobile phones. Do you think, and any of you guys, do you think there is an experience similar to that that broadcasters, traditional content owners could launch as a, you know, um, appointment television type of weekly event? Is, oh. it, is it, are you able to produce something like that? Oh, totally. And, 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 and they can and they should. Um, I think uh, everybody was so much on this, this long tail, on the, on the mount, on the binge watching tr uh, trip. Uh, that people forgot about the key elements of television and that you can reinvent it. Um, but it doesn't mean that all the expertise that was developed over the decades, um, uh, production value, lighting, talent, especially talent, um, you can do great things in the coming years and you will see great things of, uh, they won't be distributed over traditional television necessarily or probably not, but there will be a lot of apps uh, and a lot of things out there that will be appointment based that will send you a notification, that will be exciting to be part of, you can have real influence, you can win stuff. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a fantastic new opportunity for content creators especially. Yeah, Dan, I think there's something interesting in that space, I mean, using data, using a point to create appointment TV, so um, what the NBA, what you know, Turner's trying to do with the NBA, where you can pay for the fourth quarter of a game, alert you, I mean, what type of data, especially in the sports world, could they do to create events like this on an ongoing basis? with microtransactions to drive revenue where people might be adverse to blockchain or advertising? Well, I don't think those things are mutually exclusive, but um, I definitely think we're seeing a shift. There are two major shifts that we're seeing. One is content will be consumed in smaller and smaller forms. Uh, you know, Snap started this. We're starting to see it more broadly with more traditional media. Uh, the sports guys uh, are starting to take advantage of this. And frankly, I think this is an amazing development, uh, being able to purchase, you know, quarter four of a, a basketball game. Uh, and we're just going to see more and more of that. And the technologies that will enable that, um, we have those today. There's, I don't think we need anything special with data, uh, but uh, I think allowing those products to just exist is a huge move forward. But isn't there a huge gap from a content owner's perspective, a broadcaster's perspective of, of the data needed to really kind of drive personalized experiences, notifications to end you? I mean, how do they create those connections? How do they fill these gaps today outside of sports and like your platform to make sure we're alerting people when they need to be alerted? I mean, what, what, what can you do if you were a content owner sitting in there to choose? What, what, would, you be, what would you do? Go, go out and try. There's, there's a lot of tools. You, you just need a few people, you need a studio somewhere, it can be as small as this, um, green screen, uh, camera, uh, good internet connection, some, some cloud tools that, that take care of the heavy lifting and of the distribution. You don't need advertising deals, you don't need distribution deals, um, you uh, don't need very expensive infrastructure or hardware. Uh, so if you have an idea for a live show, um, that is appointment based, that is interactive, that takes advantage of push notifications, that you can monetize in any way you see fit. Um, it's, it's, it's easier than ever. It is a hundred times easier than producing a TV show was 30 years ago. 
hundred percent. I mean, the, the home studio capabilities now, you could build a studio for a fraction of the cost and, and really, like you said, set up any room and create it yourself. We're seeing it with a lot of our partners that are creating those like original content series in-house using our platform to create and edit it very quickly and easily and, and shooting out content and seeing what resonates. And, and based on that, they kind of move forward, they adjust, they try new things, but because there's not such a big price tag against it, they can explore, right? You have exploratory budget used to be, you know, uh, so expensive, you used to one show would put you, you know, uh, like completely the red. Now you can try things like quickly, you do like kind of micro shows and see what works and what resonates. And based on that, kind of build that out. Um, it's it's really uh, it's it's really an interesting time and in the video space specifically. We're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing a lot of do-it-yourself shot videos that you could shoot with a with an iPhone camera with just good lighting and you know you get get the top shot on a bowl and crack eggs into it. Shoot three second segments of, of adding all the ingredients and then just add, like stitch them all together with a platform uh, such as ours. So that's, that's uh, a good point. And one thing to add, uh, from, uh, don't forget from day one you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with every single one of your viewers. And that gives you such tremendous power over traditional broadcasters that only think in one direction. Um, so if you keep that close to heart, even if you have a niche audience, even if you don't get broadcast level audiences, it can still be worth your while, it can still be profitable. Especially if you're using good targeted advertising because then the value of that ad should be much or higher. Or subscription, right? or there's a lot of different bits. Yeah. I was recently in a marketer conference in Austin, Texas, and one of the questions that was asked on a panel was, you know, to you know, everyone in the room, how, who here in the room expects to spend more money on influencers next year in terms of their, their marketing campaigns? And I think 95% of the room raised their hands, right? So there's definitely a shift towards uh, influencers. And when we talk about influencers, even that's changed. The definition of influencers are now, it's gone down from you know, they you used to have people who were influencers like a million followers, 500,000. Now you're looking at micro influencers, you know, 5,000 to 10,000 followers is, is fine too, as long as they're we're engaged. We're influencers. Followers. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, so the idea is really, um, you know, now that everyone depends on Facebook and those kind of social platforms for traffic and that may be going away or maybe in jeopardy, um, I think a lot of our partners are talking about uh, kind of reversing the way they're doing things. So in the past, they used to go to Facebook and drive traffic to their sites through Facebook by paying Facebook. Now they're going to the influencers, giving them an original show that they shoot in the house, just like you said, a micro show. Um, they're, they're giving them the stage and they're getting organic traffic from their followers. And they don't depend as much from you know paying Facebook and so forth. So it's just a different way of creating content and looking at that in general. So. One, uh, two quick questions, and then I'm happy to open it up if anyone has any questions. What do you guys think from experiences today? Like, what's missing? What, 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 what's something you're shocked someone's, one thing, you're shocked at like a traditional content owner or someone maybe moving from, you know, like a YouTube to a more, you know, digital first. What's, what's, what are you surprised people aren't doing at this moment that can be done with technology that exists today? Ooh, I, I think, I mean, I, I don't know if it's feasible adding like a gaming element to viewing content. I think that's really fun. I think people want to engage with content. I th think people want to participate and share what they feel about things, whether it's sports or, you know, gaming. Uh, people just want to express themselves uh, and, and feel like part of a community. So gaming, adding gaming to content. Um, well, uh, that could have been my answer, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I, another topic that I'm fascinated by is, um, I mean, we, we talked about monetization through advertising, uh, subscription is another model. Uh, what I see very little good examples of is making live video especially shoppable. Uh, why can't I buy what I see in the video in a seamless, frictionless way? Uh, why do I have to s spend a lot of time searching whatever the object is or whatever is, if it's about travel, if it's about uh, gadgets, if it's about fashion, why is it so hard to find the stuff to buy? Why, why, if you see the Ali Gala in China, where they, they, I think they sell like $20 billion worth of stuff in 24 hours, it's, it's just straight up shoppable video. And why don't we see more examples of that? That's something I, I think uh, will happen. Dan? Uh, this is more of a criticism of sports broadcasting in general, but I am shocked that game discovery is still such a huge problem. So just the ability, if you are trying to find specific content, specific game, 
you know, just the ability to find that if you don't have the specific channels that you're looking for, especially with cord cutting, it's, it's a huge, huge problem. And it's a relatively easily solvable problem. They just haven't really gotten along with it yet. But. Dodger fan living in L.A. can't see a single game. Sportsnet. Yeah, it's Ooh. fantastic. Um, all right, then to a answer the last question is, what is a major technology advancement you see beyond that will power some, obviously blockchain, but power some of these experiences moving forward? I'll start. Uh, I think AI is a, a huge game changer uh, across the board, but the um, AI will really change the relationship between people and machines. Some people are still concerned about jobs being removed um, and that may be an issue, but I think we're very far away from that. I think we're entering sort of a golden age where the relationship between people and machines in terms of having uh, intelligent assistance uh, will really open up troves of media that is currently um, locked away because the economy of acquiring metadata or just processing that media isn't there. Um, what happens after that golden age remains to be seen. Hopefully killer robots aren't involved, but I think um, we're, we're entering a, a, a cool period and AI will really, will really change things. Yeah, so obviously AI as well. So <laughs> uh, I agree. I mean, I, you know, Wibbits is, is an AI-based company and it's what we do. Uh, we leverage AI and NLP. Um, and I think that, you know, in, in our, from our angle, it's more about the content creation itself. Um, and like you said, I mean, th there is, we typically have meetings where th it starts with us introducing the product, then when, when video producers see it, they go, oh my God, my job's at jeopardy. And, and it's, a funny, it's a funny fear because we always say, you know, it's the exact opposite, right? Um, if you're creating video and at the end of the day, you're losing money on every video you make, uh, then your job's in jeopardy, right? Um, so this is still, it's still businesses and they still have to figure out how to make it and monetize it in a way where they could still end up in the black. Um, and so we're the, we, we, we tell them the exact opposite. We're empowering you to make more video. We can make one video editor more efficient. We can spend, you could spend your time less on mechanics and more on actually the content and driving engagement based on the quality of the content itself and what you're saying, like your message. Don't worry about putting the logo in the correct place or placing you know, the bottom third in the right place. Um, why spend time on that? So um, with AI, we're basically offering them the ability to kind of cut down the times of finding the correct media and aligning everything correctly and doing everything that way. And it's just, it's more automated. It just makes their kind of creation easier uh, and more interesting, honestly. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one, but I, I, I think what um, what we saw in the past few years is that the whole filter bubble thing where people were only exposed to like-minded people, clearly that's not it's worked done. out well. Yeah, exactly. So what I hope is, is that um, as uh, more and more people can actually break through the filters and have tools where they can reach large audiences at the same time, uh, that good storytelling and smart thinking and being open-minded and being curious about other people is going gonna, is gonna to prevail again. Uh, and that we go back a little bit to the roots of the internet uh, where everything was open and everything was kind of built on ideals. Um, but by making content creation more democratic, uh, making it more interactive, adding game mechanics, things like that, I, I think we can really uh, find back some of those, uh, those values we had originally online um, and uh, yeah, also the big companies that rule the internet now, hopefully will learn from this and apply those lessons. Great, um, I think we have time for like one question, if anyone has. Um, so interactive features with broadcasting seem to be a really popular topic. Why hasn't this been happening with broadcasters already? I mean, we've been able to interact with a TV station over the internet for 20 years, and in fact, I have seen some shows where you can send me an email in or instant message and so on and get some minimal interactivity. Uh, but there's no technical reason that's stopping us today from you know, interacting and voting on something that you saw in the news or putting a commentary in on a game or some, doing something like that. So since it's not technical, what are the reasons why broadcasters up until recently haven't adopted um, interactivity in broadcast media? Honestly, I think it's a mindset. I think, I think people are still not in the place where they view their TV as their computer, as their phone. And once that, you know, the, the TV screen 
you see, well, the TV used to be a TV, and now it's just a screen, right? Now it's connected to all these different things. And I think that as that progresses and it incorporates more and more into our kind of like household as, as a different, as a more integrated kind of part of our life, I think people will start viewing it as something that they can interact with just like their phone, right? Um, so, you know, the question is really, is that going to happen or is it just your phone going to be that screen, right? Like, is eventually, is it, is it both going to be the same device, just you're going to see them either in your pocket or on your wall, right? Um, and that's, that's yet to be seen. I, I think that there's a good probability that in the future, when you walk in your house, automatically your phone will be projected onto your wall, you know? And then everything will be there, and you'll be able to talk to it just like you can to your phone now. Like, I don't know if you use the Siri thing, but I say, hey, Siri, five times a day. I hope she doesn't. Everyone's fine. Well. She's not listening right now. Um, but yeah, so so I think that once that happens, the interaction will grow because it'll it'll just be like something. It's like fidgeting with your phone. You'll be fidgeting with the TV show. You'll be in participating. Um, that's one. I, and the other thing I think is it's about making it fun, right? Like interacting is great, but you like what what causes interaction? It's you get some sort of feedback. You get some sort of return on that interaction. And um, and I think that that's, that's something that still needs to be developed. Uh, wrap it up. Please. Yeah. Um, well, interactivity is already happening. Like shows like The Voice, you can vote for the winner using an app. Uh, of course, social media is also a second screen platform for a lot of people. Um, there's also a lot of genres where it doesn't make sense. We did a second screen project for Game of Thrones in Europe, and nobody used it. The, the, the TV is so beautiful, the series is so beautiful, and there's so much going on. You don't have time to go and, and watch. But I think the, the key question, uh, the key part of, of, of your question is, uh, why would a broadcaster do it? And I think uh, they don't have a business model for it yet. And that comes back to my earlier point. A broadcaster cannot ask more money to advertisers for somebody who is engaged with it. And I think they should and they, and they, they would like to, but that's where we need the currency and the metrics. Uh, it's changing, but it's a lot more, uh, har it's harder to change the business model, the revenue models that broadcast television companies deal with. Great. Thank you, Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you to the panel. Uh, great conversation. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, welcome to this session here on Destination Next. Um, I got a great, great company here. We were already discussing lots of stuff before we even started, so it's a good thing to start off. Um, so the topic is personalization on a grand scale in next generation TV. Uh, my name is Jilma Schoen, and um, I have here Trip, Elliot, and Mark. Um, so maybe we do a quick introduction. Um, me as last um, trip. Please introduce right, yeah. yourself. I, uh, thank you for moderating, and thanks uh, you guys for having us. I'm the SVP of business development for a company called Connect. We've been around for about a year. We are an AI-driven solution uh, that is bringing new layers of engagement and data to linear television as well as commerce. Uh, I'm Elliot Sakatov. I'm an account executive for Microsoft, uh, mostly focused on media entertainment with about 20 years of experience in the industry. Fantastic. My name is Mark Todd. I'm the CEO and founder of Screens. Uh, Screens is a SaaS video, um, basically an operating system um, to allow people to manipulate uh, their video uh, easier. Okay. And um, as I mentioned, I'm Yilmaz and the founder and CEO of TradeCast TV. 
and we deliver infrastructure for uh, companies or persons to start their own interactive broadcast network. Um, so, gentlemen, Next Generation TV, we were already discussing what even Next Generation TV is, but let's start as di at this point. So, um, Crip, is Next Generation TV merely on the horizon, or are, are we already full in transition? Are we already in the middle of Next Generation TV? The transition, in my opinion, is already happening, right? I mean, I think it, a lot of it is a matter of over the course of the next one to three to five years, how quickly this scales. It seems that, uh, you know, technology tends to do that on a more rapid rate every year, so we should be there sooner rather than later. But, you know, listening in on the, the previous panel, subjects, you know, revolving, revolving around sh shoppable video, right? I mean, I think those technologies already exist. Right? It's how do we bring them to the forefront? How do we make them seamless? Right? How do we introduce them either on the TV, on a mobile device, um, or frankly on any screen at this point, but if they're getting linked to the biggest screen in the home, right? and a lot of brand advertisers are leveraging this screen as the primary way to, to drive awareness and mass scale still at this point, whether that's broadcast or OTT, um, how can we hold it more accountable, right? How can we bring more data into play? How can we make it commerce enabled? Um, how can we provide more data back to advertisers to prove out that that TV investment is in fact doing its job? So, so basically we are already in the middle of everything happening. Um, and Elliot, um, this journey, this transition of the whole market, probably it will be faster than we can even imagine. Certainly, I think uh, what we're actually at the, at the cusp of, especially when we think about uh, autonomous vehicles, I think that's an actually interesting space as we think about how autonomous vehicles are gonna change how we consume content and when. Um, the ability to have a screen or a camera or you know, you know, the ability to have your windshield as your television, as you're driving. I imagine a scenario where you put into your phone where you're going, uh, you know, if the map tells you exactly how long it's going to take you to get to, get to the destination, it knows where you're driving by, and then the content's coming back down onto the windshield, and you're consuming that content, then all of a sudden you're driving by Taco Bell, and then there's a coupon that pops up and says, hey, go get 25 cents <laughs> off a you know, seven-layer burrito because you happen to be driving by. Yeah. And that's really the personalization. Uh, that's not too far off. I mean, the, the data is there. We just don't have the autonomous vehicles in, in full perpetuity. Yeah. I know even the companies that are already working on content for... Uh, your personal fitness television inside of your car when you go to, to work and then if you stop by to have dinner then it all mixes up it would be really great um, so uh, Mark um, next generation TV will it be more targeted to niche markets or can we also next gen the traditional television in content yeah that's a good question um, I think we are in a world of niche everything everything I touch is a walled garden I have to log in to even get my own Nest video of my own video. Um, the walled gardens are, I think, uh, an artifact of the past and also an artifact of the technology that was given to us by a display, for example. We're limited by the output mechanism. And I think to e expand on Elliot's point is that autonomous cars, really in general, any pane of glass Anywhere you go, you want all your content, whether it's your biometrics, your Seinfeld episodes, your fantasy football, your Nest camera with your baby cam, it's all your content. So I think instead of niche, I think the move is desperately trying to empower uh, individuals to visualize the content they already own or they already pay for and create personalized experiences. And the technology is now, just now, coming on the market that makes this possible and it really will be uh, trans transformational. Yeah, we, we just talked about the, the possibilities of, of renting personal streams to everybody and, and the cost of that technology is dropping uh, at, at speed of light. Yeah, it, it is, it's dropping at the speed of light. So you have, you have a couple of fundamental things that have nothing to do with content. One is 5G networks and the edge, right? So they're big pipes to everybody. Today, we're already a stream per person. Everybody here watches Netflix, Hulu, it's a stream per person. What we've been missing is an encoder per person. The idea that 
instead of just looking, everybody's watching the same Top Gun file and being streamed down to you, the idea that you can, each individual person, manipulate and change your scene and blend your stuff and it encodes and it sends down to you, that cost is going from $2 an hour down to essentially near free. And that's a semiconductor thing and it's a cloud thing. And I believe that everybody in this show will take advantage of the fact that they can, they can do this. Okay. Well, we have good news for you then. Got a question? Yeah, question. Uh, I'm Brock Davigno from Freedom Interactive Television Networks, and it's Melinda Pillsbury Foster in charge of content. You are entirely correct. You're all correct. I've been going by this booth all afternoon, and I was going, everything they're saying is right, except <laughs> they keep talking about it, we're doing it. We want to form an alliance. Uh, for instance, uh, if, just take art, how many, do you know how many phone calls the record is for a television show on the weighty issue of which teenager can dance the best? No. Nope. So you think you can dance? 94 million phone calls. Would you like a penny for each one of those? Can we stream who does it the best? Yeah. Um, now, would you like dance lessons? Would you like to support a dancer in an international competition? Would uh, you, and they can put money where their mouth is, okay? Um, grand scale, satellite, IPTV, any other means, and then the audience feedback. We keep wandering around here and nobody but you is talking intelligently about <laughs> the ability to set up the hardware to do this. And that's what we're here for is to integrate maybe the whole convention into one place. I don't know. But that's what we're trying to do. Could you address when I see senior VP do business development, I see all these other things, we're looking and have contacted investors that are willing to say, how much is it? You know, come on, give us some numbers for what you can do. And that's what we're here for trying to figure out. But we, ha we actually have a, a, a proof of concept here in 1992. Yes, and you'll have a question after I finish this. In 1992, you might have remembered that there was a candidate Name right. Ross Perot. I'm going to introduce you I was to the 13 man years who drove old him to 38 percent. He also yeah. determined the winner of the presidential election, who was Bill Clinton instead of the most popular president in American history, George H.W. Bush. But I one pioneered very pioneered important him. thing with technology, of course, and implementing technology is timing. So lots of great things have been invented already, but timing was off. So if we all get here together and start working on timing, and the technology is here for these kinds of things, then we're getting somewhere. And so I, I would argue that, that AI solves a lot of that timing question, right? I mean, I think some of the things that we're working on is what's to prevent anybody from bringing linear broadcast television into the next generation, right? Almost every one of these devices in some way, shape, or, for, or form is connected, right? If we can pull that connection through and allow it to lean on that linear broadcast, and now if I'm watching So You Think You Can Dance, right? We can actually put an interactive voting button up on the bottom of the screen that I can engage with in my remote, right? I could also use my voice, right? I talk about voice being the next UI. If I've got a Google Home device or an Alexa that's linked to the same Wi-Fi as my television, those two are now synced and can talk to each other. I don't even need to pick up the remote, right? I can now engage with this television broadcast with my voice in real time based on data that's being ingested into an AI engine and, and, and pushed out in a way that an advertiser wants to display it to a, to a viewer. So I think a lot of this already exists. Right? It's just how to intelligently deploy it in the market in front of the right audience. Yeah, and then you know the real question is how do you entice them to actually interact? That's really the problem. That's where your personalization comes in, which is when you talk about the next-gen TV of how it's specifically to an actual individual. How do I get you in this household that I theorize had makes fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars, probably has two dogs and a cat, and maybe a brand new Toyota Corolla or whatever it is in the driveway? How do I make sure that you then interact? Because the hardest part, especially that we saw coming up about the second screen, was how do you get somebody to get off of Facebook, get out of email, grab their phone, connect it to your TV, and then have them interact? It's a huge barrier. Yeah. 
So if we if we look that at if you program it, yeah. <laughs> But we'll look at your stuff afterwards because of freedom, freedom, freedom TV networks dot com, and I want to uh, hear from you guys. You're making so much sense. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. You. Um, so if we, we were wondering, Ed, can we put a focus on what next gen TV is? Uh, we heard a lot of things: uh, control control of your content, extensive viewer data, personalization. We just had timing. Um, Content advertising, every everything's important. Um, but is there more than that to take account? Technology, of course, r rendering, um, timing. Are there other things we we need to really look at? Sure, there's a generational gap. Any of you all been to a Twitch con? <laughs> I have. Yeah. That's a whole society where a hundred thousand people show up on a Wednesday, in the middle of the day. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, they don't see the world at all the way that we grew up. Um, and uh, you end up with these pockets of generational differences. And so, uh, you know, you talk to ABC and they're not even sure how to get even touch to these guys. They don't even know what they are, what they do, how they spend their time before they can even make a show for them to then charge advertising. They can't get to them. Huge challenge is that the fragmentation in walled gardens have become so complex that I just say, you know what? This is the three things I like, and that's all I'm going to do. Close enough. So, so basically, we will have an, an, a certain generation adapting the new kind of television, the next gen television. A certain well, generation are having like a hybrid model they're, they're, they're working uh, on. Well, I think we already know the answer. I mean, look, anybody who watches science fiction movies. Like, if you watch uh, Iron Man or any of the, what's the Black Panther, that's what I want. We, the, the, the artists already know what we want. We just haven't been able technically to do it because that thing works a certain way. Yeah. And content rights licenses don't let me put the Super Bowl next to a Twitter feed, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I, I think that intuitively society knows they want the TV to be uh, AI. They w you want to have access to it, you want to talk to it, you want to touch it, you want to move it, you want to be Tony Stark. We just need to make it work like that. And the good news is, is that the technology, the semiconductor technology is available to do that now. And that's really what's going to rock people's worlds, I believe. Yeah. So we're talking now all about technology, but of course we have the content itself. Um, so El Elliot, what should content, m content makers need to understand? while creating content for this next generation of TV? That's a good question. So I go back to the idea of autonomous vehicles. So if I know that I have a 44-minute drive from going from Los Angeles to some other place, which is probably about 15 feet away, um, then I'll probably be able to consume the latest episode of The Bachelor, which I love, have categorically. But if I have a 17-minute drive or a 12-minute drive, what does my content look like? I still want to consume it. I want to get everything that I want. Maybe it's storyline-driven. Maybe it's personalized because I love Amanda and I want to know everything that happened on their date. And I only want to see scenes with that. So you have AI to recognize the metadata where just Amanda's in the scenes. And then I also can analyze the, the scene itself to understand what the sentiment is. And it gets delivered to me personally while I'm in the vehicle. So I think over the course of the next two, three years, we're going to start to see um, your sort of three uh, act stories changing or at least there'll be 10 minute videos like facebook's experimenting with right now yeah the length of content based on ai um and which opportunities are there to enrich legacy content in all these kinds of networks because we have tons of content out there already and what can we do to meet the expectations of next gen tv with older content i think a, a lot of that legacy content is being consumed over digital channels Right? I mean, you'd argue that the Hulus of the world and the, the studios themselves are driving consumption of older seasons and older episodes. And because that's happening primarily over those digital channels, that a lot of this, this AI, a lot of the technology can more readily be made available over those digital channels to make those experiences more personal, right? Understand what kind of mood Elliot is in based on other content he's consumed and can then recommend to him other older seasons or older episodes of shows based on just that. So I think that the digital attachment to a lot of that legacy content is gonna make it a little bit easier to make that delivery smarter and, and, and enable it in that direction, but. 
yeah, I think a lot of that's metadata driven as well. So what are the characters? What are the story arcs? What's the scene like? Is it complementary to the stuff I've already watched? Um, you know, is it, you know, just because I watched, you know, episode one of this show doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to like the season uh, three of that same of that same show. So getting, creating content that's sort of evergreen in that sort of way is really about metadata and really driving down and understanding what the core underlying layers are. So all this technology, data, personalization, content enriching, um, and there, this creates so many options of new advertising possibilities or revenue models. What, 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 what ideas do you, what, what opportunities do you see there? I mean, again, I think we talked about this briefly earlier, but, but how do you, with relevancy, make all of this video shoppable, right? I mean, I, we know that myself or, or Elliot or Mark is not going to want to buy every product we see supported in an episode of X show, but we each have our own interests, and how do you highlight that against other data that we're collecting from that individual? So I think some of the things that we're working on is, again, ingesting through artificial intelligence exactly what's coming out of that television screen, whether it's connected or linear, right? And then creating this new currency for advertisers to understand exactly who that individual is and what their level of engagement is with my product so I can then, in subsequent episodes or different shows or different pieces of content, understand what to highlight for them versus their neighbor or another individual within that household, right? So I think it's understanding the individuality of content consumption and leveraging new technologies, making that content readily shoppable and, and easily transactable. Yeah. And um, Mark, we, we talked about adding different layers of interactivity on content, uh, stuff that you do. Um, what yeah, options are in there? Yeah, my friend Connect over here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, combining both of those questions, um, uh, if you take live content, the future of not just advertising, but monetizing content that you're currently throwing away. I'll give you a good example of this. Take any baseball game, any baseball fans. At a baseball game, there's six, seven, eight cameras, blimp cam, a hot dog cam, blimp, uh, you know, umpire cam. You've got, you've got content, rich content. Today, we don't have the mechanism to get that out. That goes all to a truck outside the park. One guy decides the layout. It, it's replicated to 20 million people. If I could take all that content, send that to 20 million people, and allow them to choose which camera view they wanted based on what they paid Major League Baseball and or the, the TV person, the amount of money that you, you recognize by monetizing content that you don't have the physical mechanism to do today is enormous. And I think that will help drive, really, the future of TV, and that's why I believe it's an encoder per person, simply. Yeah. So the, the traditional and also the digital video space is clearly also having major issues with the amount of advertising dollars that go to um, the video network, the social video networks. Um, how will the, the next gen TV cope with that and, and be competitive? A lot of it, I think, has to do with holding it more accountable. Right? Being able to return more data off of what traditionally has been something that you know we get a 45-day post-campaign report from Nielsen on, right? If I can analyze that viewership in real time and see where my most engaged audiences are, all of a sudden I can charge advertisers a little bit more. Maybe it doesn't matter so much that those ad pods shrink, right? As long as we're getting our money's worth and, and returning that value on a on, on in with mass scale um, to advertisers, we've now made a case for them to keep dollars there, right, and, and help enhance that experience. I think we're going to see more talent-driven content, direct to consumers. So think of like Ronaldo, who's got 150 million followers across his, all his aggregate uh, social media, but he's given up that control back to Facebook and Instagram and, and YouTube, for that matter, without really getting the data, and then they're, they're, they're actually monetizing the side next to it rather than him directly. So I feel like that's probably going to be more niche players like that, that's going to be talent-driven. YouTube, as you mentioned uh, earlier, there's going to be YouTubers that are coming directly to the consumers, and the technology is going to allow them to do that. So maybe, maybe it is going to be an encoder per person. Maybe it's going to be an encoder per, you know, actually broadcaster. I don't particularly know, but I think that we're going to see more and more people go direct to consumer. Yeah, and, and I think, of course, that's the, the, the market I'm in, I'm in niche and getting in control of data and content is really one of the big things that can make a difference between uh, the social, social networks. Um, but is the industry ready? Um, both broadcasters, producers, advertisers. Um, I think 
we all here and, and, and also in the comments uh, have a feeling and, and know what's going on and what's coming up, but isn't the industry acting a little bit slow? I can take that one if you want. Well, okay. No, 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 no. Ellis can have a much better answer than me, so yeah. he can go after me and correct me. Um, I think the industry is designed to go slow, quite frankly. Big companies um, can't move business models uh, quickly uh, at all. I think it's our job as uh, innovators and startups, um, and from what I see is we have to make it, uh, show it, show that there's a return on investment, and then they're specifically designed to stamp and repeat to get the volume. So uh, the more that we can find funding to make these ideas a reality, and the good news is is that every there's no doubt about it, there's a massive, massive problem. We can't keep watching, you know, the price is right in the same structure. Um, the world's not going that direction, so. How dare you, I love prices, right? <laughs> <laughs> so look, I, I, think, I think what we've found is that people have been trained to experiment, uh, especially on the advertising front. Facebook, Instagram, Google, have all sort of trained uh, advertisers to experiment. There's programmatic spending, and that's just gonna be the way that it is, but they're, they're trained to try stuff out. So I, I think, yes, the uptick's gonna be slow. They're not gonna move a billion dollars tomorrow. but they might start to move a million, two million, five million, seven million, and that'll eventually be aggregate, but it's really gonna be experimentation, figuring out what models work. I don't think that there's gonna be a huge shift tomorrow, though. And, and what, what can we, as like the, the, the newer companies that um, uh, try to develop these kinds of technologies to help, what can we do to speed up the process? Tell our stories. Yeah. Educate. Educate. Right. I mean, just be out there. You know, I think it, it, we all know this because it's the game we play, but it's, you know, the more people we can talk to about this, the better. I mean, I, ho hopefully there are a lot of people watching the live stream and, you know, this, this, this content and the content previous to us will, will live on in perpetuity on the web, but, you know, it's on us to get this out, right? I mean, I think if we can get this message out and at the same time, you know, slowly build out case studies with the advertisers who are willing to move first, right, to then be able to put it in front of others and, and have them invest. That's just, you know, that's how, it, how the model works. But I think the more we can all collectively talk about it and socialize it, the quicker it'll, it'll happen. I think it's fairly simple. Evangelize and then deliver. Yep. If you don't deliver, then do something else. Yeah, that's a ha hallelujah, brother. It's deliver. You gotta actually do something, you gotta make something, you gotta show something, sell it. It's pretty yeah. straightforward, actually. Pro prove everything that we are saying. Yeah. So, um, so basically that's what everybody needs to do while creating some fast movement in this uh, exciting shift in the whole market. Um, and on NAB you could start with it by taking a close look at all the startups here uh, in the Sprocket area, but also in the uh, entire in innovation pipeline that's over there at the end um, of this hall. And, um, really take advantage of all the smaller companies that are doing great innovation there and take our, your time to look at it. Our startup is actually in the South Hall as well, so ah, feel uh, free to stop by. Yeah, everybody, right. I mean, yeah, all startups everywhere. We're all contributing to a collective vision, right? We, do, we, we service different aspects of, of media, right? And again, you said it right, if, if we can all sort of join together and everyone can you know, share ideas, I think we'll help each other out and help the industry. Yeah. And, and I think uh, after this uh, closing remarks, we can look at the, the demo of the, or, or are, we, are they gone now, the people that ask questions? <laughs> that's, that's something you never do, you never leave if you have a good pitch. <laughs> so, thank, so, thank you so thank you for the attention and um, we'll wrap this one up.